Welcome to the Midlife Mavericks podcast, where we empower men in their prime to redefine what it means to thrive beyond 40. Join us as we navigate the complexities of midlife, offering insights, strategies, and inspiration to reclaim your health, vitality, and purpose. From personal stories of transformation to expert interviews and actionable tips, each episode is designed to support you on your journey to live the best life in your midlife and beyond. Get ready to unleash your inner maverick and embrace the adventure of aging with grace, strength, and purpose. Welcome to another inspiring episode of the Midlife Mavericks podcast, where we explore the transformative journey of those redefining midlife and beyond. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce Debbie Wise, an incredible woman whose story of resilience, reinvention, and self-discovery will truly move you. Debbie's life took an unexpected turn at a very young age becoming the primary caregiver for her father after his stroke, a role she held for 30 years. This experience shaped her into a fixer and problem solver, always putting the needs of others before her own. But at age 50, Debbie had a powerful realisation. She had been living for everyone else and neglecting her own dreams and well-being. In this episode, Debbie shares how she transitioned from a life of I can't to embracing the empowering mantra, maybe I can. From overcoming limiting beliefs to reclaiming her health, losing weight, and becoming an author, Debbie's journey is a testament to the power of mindset and taking small, actionable steps towards change. Whether you're struggling with some limiting beliefs or simply searching for your next chapter, Debbie's story will remind you that it's never too late to put yourself first and live the life that you've always dreamed of. Get ready to be inspired to make meaningful change in your own life and start believing in the power of, maybe I can. Debbie, welcome to the Midlife Mavericks podcast. Well, it's delightful to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Strat. I'm looking forward to our conversation, mate. I've been uh, diving into your books a little bit and reading a little bit more about your work and what you've been doing. So I'm excited to have this chat today. Just to kick things off, I usually start with this two-part question. So if you and I were going to be on an airplane, the first part of that question is, where would we be heading? Have you got a favorite holiday destination or something on the bucket list that you would like to tick off? Well, I'd like to go to Australia. <laughs> I guess that wouldn't be so exciting for you. <laughs> oh, mate, there's so much of Australia is... I still haven't seen, so definitely yeah, I could. mean, same here with the United States. I, I agree with that. But uh, actually, in about 10 days, I am headed off to Italy and Greece. So that's on my bucket list, too. Uh, beautiful, mate. Whereabouts in Italy are you going? Uh, we're actually going on a cruise out of Rome. Oh, beautiful. Sounds 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 really good. I like Italy and I, I like I like Greece as well. So they're both uh, both beautiful places. Part two of that question: If you know you and I were to get a conversation going and we were to talk about your purpose and passion, what would you say they are right now? Definitely, my purpose and passion are the same thing. I discovered late in life and that's to let everyone and anyone know that despite your circumstances despite your age there are no excuses each of us has responsibility has the responsibility and the power to do whatever we want to live the life we want beautiful yep yep that sounds awesome mate i'm thinking it's a, a really good purpose and passion to have especially in this day and age when I think you and I were just talking about before we jumped online, you know, we're overrun with responsibilities, we're overrun with technology, all these things going on, and it's easy to overlook, you know, things like self-care um, and really sort of dive into that. When when you think about your self-care these days, like, can I ask, like, what maybe some of your non-negotiables are? So for me, I do um, love to exercise, and that's a non-negotiable, not just good for the physical, but for me, especially the mental health benefits, the stress relief, those kind of things, that's definitely a non-negotiable. And one that I've been working on is learning to say no to invitations yeah. or opportunities um, that don't really. Yeah, yeah. That's a powerful skill to master. I, think I all... haven't gotten it yet, but I'm working on it. I think we've all been there with that. I think there was even a time in my life where I, I told myself I'd say yes to everything just so I could... Uh... I suppose, keep moving forward in life. And I think maybe when we're young and we've got a lot to prove, we, we jump on that bag wagon pretty easy. 
Um, and maybe it's a little bit hard to get off, especially as we age. We're trying to trying to please people, please everybody else, aren't we? Deb, I was reading your website in preparation for this podcast, and something that sort of stood out to me, or was very obvious, was your strength in sort of kindness, um, resilience, empathy, um, and your ability to transform you know, maybe some sort of adversity into empowerment. And it sounds like you know on your podcast you've faced some incredible life challenges along the way, and you define yourself as like someone who's a lifelong, you define yourself, sorry, as someone who's like a lifelong um, fixer and problem solver, which I guess has allowed you to shift that mindset and prioritize, you know, your health and happiness. I just want to hear maybe a little bit more about that incredible journey that you've been on. So if you'd like to share that with our listeners so they can get a good perspective of, of who you are and then, um, you know, why we're going to talk about, you know, the sort of you know, self-care and why it's so important. Sure. So at 17, I became a family caregiver. My father, who was only just turned 46, had a massive stroke, and luckily he survived. But my parents were divorced. I, I have a younger brother, four years younger, so he was 13. And from that moment on, for the next 30 years, I was my father's primary caregiver, which was a lot to take on um, as a late teen, early 20s. And at first I relished that role and then it became burdensome. Uh, I grew resentful and burnt out. And um, then when my oldest son was two, he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So, you know, being a parent is being a caregiver and challenging, but I have two sons and I can tell you that the one with special needs is uh, a whole different ball game than the other. And then unfortunately, my husband also suffered from a variety of both physical and mental illness, and he became permanently disabled and was really unable to function. And out of the blue, then diagnosed with terminal blood cancer, which from that time, he only lived for six months. And I stopped working and was home with him for those six months, taking care of him 24 seven. Wow, mate. Well, that, that's and um, na- yeah, that's incredible. Now like, it's especially been, at it's, such a young age, like you said, at seventeen, you know, you're yeah. sort of taking on that responsibility. Um, how did that impact? How do you feel that impacted your health, your social connection, just everything that sort of would be going on normally for, let's say, a teenager at that point in life? Like, can you describe that to us a little bit more? So, on a positive note. I would say that because there were definitely positives looking back now, I, as a young girl, I did not have a lot of self-confidence. I always struggled with my weight and always felt judged, didn't want to be seen, couldn't handle, you know, the teasing, the comments from, from kids and adults as well. And so I would never speak up on behalf of myself. And then when my dad got sick, it was a whole different story when he was depending on me, you know? So I had to find my voice and my courage and a little bit of confidence that I didn't know even existed in there. So, you know, I also, looking back, you know, I was forced to grow up quickly, which is a good and a bad thing. I handled challenges and and were faced with challenges younger than most. So I think that did definitely add to my resilience and Mm -hmm. gave me confidence and, you know, set me up to be a little more successful maybe in my life. On the flip side, you know, I didn't get to have that carefree time in my life, you know, in our 20s when, you know, you're just doing whatever, whenever, take off whenever you want, go away for a weekend. You know, I, I was always worried about my father, worried about my father because he was my sole responsibility. Mm. And so, like I said earlier, I I definitely did grow to feel resentful and overburdened and eventually really led to a period of burnout or really I didn't understand a way out and didn't understand what I had been doing to myself until I turned about 50. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Looking back, if you could give yourself advice, like your younger self advice during that period of time, what would you say that would be? 
definitely that taking care of myself is not selfish. Mm. That is a myth that I think so many of us believe, and I did for the longest time. You know, everybody else's needs came first and foremost besides, you know, before mine. And if by chance I tried to put myself first, I was incredibly guilty, and I never did. But what I realized as I got older was not only was I suffering, but they were suffering too because I wasn't showing up as my kindest, nicest, most patient person, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so many caregivers, they don't take care of themselves. And especially as the caregivers get older, all of a sudden they wind up having the health problems and then they can't even take care of their loved one. So mm. it's not selfish, it's imperative. Yeah, no, exactly. It's a very powerful realization to have because I think a lot of us can feel maybe trapped, whether trap, trap's the right word, but just like stuck in that way of like, okay, I've got to keep doing this and I am keep trying to please other people. Maybe I'm serving other people or I am putting my maybe my health last, like you sort of say self-care. When do you think you started to realize this? Like you said, was it 50 that you started to realize this or was the inklings before that, you know, what was what you were doing in your life wasn't, you know, serving you? I think I, I knew before it wasn't serving me, but I didn't see any way out. You know, mm. there was no solution. The only solution would have been for me to stop caring for them. And that was not an option to me. Mm. So I didn't see a solution until I did turn 50 and my friends insisted on taking me away for a weekend to celebrate my birthday. And I wanted to go, but didn't want to go because I thought, how will my family managed without me just for two nights, but miraculously they did. And in that weekend, I realized that I had like lost myself. We were having some deep conversations about our hopes and our dreams. And I'm thinking hopes and dreams, like mm -hmm. what? Who? I have no idea who has time to think about that kind of thing. And um, it was something for me about the number 50. And I think you know, for me, it was 50 for some, it's 40 or 30 or 60 or what, you know, or maybe not a number, an event, right? It was something for me about that number that really made me think to myself, boy, there's a chance that I don't have 50 years ahead of me. And if something were to happen to me today, would I have regrets? Yeah. And I would. And I didn't know, I had no idea. It wasn't like I was like, you know, this always wanted to be an artist or a, like I had nothing, no dream, no, but I, I knew that I hadn't lived the life that I wanted to live for myself, even though I didn't know what that was. Yeah. What an incredible weekend that must have been going away for your birthday and to have that oh my powerful realization. <laughs> I don't think I don't think there's ever been a time in my life that I laughed as much in 48 hours than I Perfect. laughed in that weekend. That's awesome. It sounds like you must have some really good friends then, and the people that took you away were uh, really looking out for you. That's great to hear. I think Absolutely. a lot of us, a lot of us as we age, I think there's a point, you know, maybe it's when we get to 50, maybe it's younger, where we start to realize just how important I think our health is. I think it slowly starts to cr climb that list of values that we have. I think when we're younger, we take it for granted. We just, oh, we can eat what we want. We train how we want. We do what we want and we just expect it to be there. But as we age, it slowly starts to climb up. But I think a lot of us don't know where to start when we get to that realization. Like, okay, I want to be healthier. I, I want to take care of myself. Like for you, how did you start this journey or what changed for you when you had this realization? So, as I mentioned, I've always had a lifelong weight problem and I'm not talking about like 10 or 20 pounds. I'm talking substantial amounts at different points in my life. It varied, right? I mean, I was on my first diet when I was 10 or under. So I, you know, at 50, I found myself a hundred pounds overweight, wow. very unhappy, obviously very unhealthy. Now, especially as a woman up to that point, it was all about how I looked and my appearance, but it was never about my health. When I kind of said, all right, something's got to give with my life. I knew that this was the first area that I needed to focus on. 
because now it was about being there as you know to see my kids grow up and to meet my grandchildren and and all of those things and live a happy active life you know well into old age and so i decided to you know what i wish i wish i knew how and how i got to this but i don't i just decided that all right for 50 years i've been like losing gaining losing gaining how's that working for you not so good i have to try something different not a different diet or food plan or extra like nothing like that i decided that i was putting too much pressure on myself you know i would always be like oh my goodness if you don't lose 25 pounds in three months then you're a failure if i ate something bad forget it i can't do this right it was that all or nothing uh, and there was no all or nothing because nobody's perfect so of course i would fail and then I'd throw in the towel, gain it all back and say to hell with it. And this time I was just like, you know what? I'm never getting off this. Like this isn't a diet. And, and I'm going to use a word that everybody throws around nowadays, but back then they didn't. I did realize this is a lifestyle. Like I'm never coming off this. So that means that if it takes me five years to lose the weight, Oh, well, it takes me five years. At least I'm headed in the right direction. If I eat pizza and ice cream, my favorite foods, does that mean I'm a failure? No, I'm going to eat pizza and ice cream. And it was kind of giving myself that permission and taking that pressure off. And I really started just setting super small, easy, very easily attainable goals. And then I'd feel good about myself. I was like, okay, that wasn't so bad. What next, you know, what can I add next? And all those little things, all the, you know, eventually added up to um, losing about 90 pounds of it. And that was probably about eight years ago now. And it's the first time in my life that I've ever maintained any kind of weight loss. I don't even know if I've ever done it for a year. <laughs> I love what you just said there, because from a health coaching perspective and what I do with a lot of my clients is exactly what you've just said. It's like that permission, like giving yourself permission, very, very powerful, setting small achievable goals and just having that vision and that idea of, okay, this is the path I'm heading on because it's a healthy lifestyle. And if I stick with it in the long term, I'm going to see the results. And it's just like you're ticking all of the right boxes that are just going to help you. I suppose it is successful, but it's also giving you permission to fail and it's giving you ex permission to explore and just enjoy the journey and keep, uh, you know, motivated, keep positive with all the little steps that you're making. So it's really incredible. Did you have someone to guide you with this or is this just something you picked up or something you read or just like it felt normal? Like how did you successfully unlock I this, really you know, don't. this journey? I wish I, I, I don't know. I can tell you that for me, um, Weight Watchers has always been the one program that if I had success, that was it. And so I did, that is, you know, attending, that was my first goal was don't worry about what you're eating. Don't worry about when you're moving. Don't worry about any of that. Just go to a meeting. That's it. That's all I did for the first mm -hmm. like two or three months. And then I slowly added. So I guess Weight Watchers, but it wasn't really, it was all about my mindset. It was all about my mindset. It still is. And I never thought I'm going to be 61 in four days. And I never thought in my lifetime that I wouldn't be obsessive about food. And I don't mean, oh, my gosh, I have to eat. Oh, my, like that, that scared, like, oh, gosh, how many calories? Well, if I have that and I don't have that, no, you know, mm -hmm. I eat what I feel like I want to eat and I like I said, if I eat something that I thought, eh, that didn't make me feel good. Okay. I'm not going to berate myself. Yeah. And so it no longer holds that same power over me that it has my whole life. Yeah. Incredible, mate. You've had such an incredible transformation. Like not only is it the mindset and like the self-care and like the realization of what's going on there and how you've managed to prioritize that, but I didn't know the side of, you know, your struggles with your weight and physical transformation. That you've obviously achieved as well and what an incredible thing to be able to do especially like i think sometimes 
know, we, as we get older, we sort of think, oh, it's too late. You know, I should have done that sooner. And we sort of make these excuses or we tell ourselves that we can't do it, but you've just grabbed the bull by the horns and you've just gone for it, mate. And what an amazing transformation um, you've experienced along the way there. It's incredible. You're Thank also, you. Thank you. you're also, you're also now an author. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? How did that come about? Yeah, that's a, it's a crazy, crazy thing. <laughs> um, so let me just say, never wanted to be an author. Never. I, I mean, I think I read a statistic like 80 or 85% of the population wants to write a book. I was not part of that 80 or 85%. I am a numbers girl. Math is my jam. My, my careers have all been about numbers. And as you know, kind of when I realized, okay, I have learned a lot, self-taught, and now I want to share what I've learned with other people. I um, was trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. And everybody kept saying, well, you know, you have a lot of stories. You've been through a lot. Write a book. Write a book. And I said, well, you know, I had a lot of imposter syndrome just about my stories, feeling like they weren't impactful enough because I didn't feel that they were I don't know harsh enough like I didn't thank goodness I haven't been through some you know incredibly horrific trauma mm. um so that was the first thing the second thing was well I've heard of ghost writers how much does it cost because I can't write this book and one day I was listening to this podcast and the host was interviewing a woman who helped first-time authors get their stories out there. And I was like, I never listened to this podcast. I think the universe is sending me a message because this is just too bizarre. Mm. So I contacted her and she was, I, I instantly connected with her and she was launching a 12-week course in a few weeks. And I was about to say yes. And then my husband was diagnosed with a, uh, the blood cancer, which for him was terminal. And I thought to myself, well, there goes that idea. Obviously, it was not meant to happen. And luckily, at the time, I was seeing a therapist and I told her about the course and, you know, mentioned, obviously, I'm not going to do it now, but maybe down the road. And she said, no, I disagree. I think now is the perfect time. And I said, are you kidding me? I don't know what's going to be a, you know, lie ahead for all of us. And what if I can't show up? And what if there's homework and I can't do the homework? And she said, who cares? Who cares? She said, this will give you something separate to focus on just for you. Other than, you know, the difficult trauma that you and your family are going through. Yeah. And... I took her advice and I joined the group and I, even the first month or two, I still didn't really think I was actually going to write the book. I was really struggling, but once I figured a few things out, I found that I really enjoyed it. And while my husband was in the hospital, I would bring my computer with me and right when he was sleeping or went down for a test, if we were home, I would get up at, you know, 530 in the morning and right then or right when he was napping in the afternoon, I really prioritized it because she was right. This was actually a form of self-care, which I never would have thought of, you know, and that was learning something new. Yep. And when he passed away, I was three chapters shy of finishing. Wow. What an incredible time. I like to have so much like that happening in your life all at once. And I like say it's incredible that you're listening to that podcast and then it evolved into you know, that opportunity and well done to your therapist, I suppose, for you know, encouraging you to do that. It's, 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 it's good because the next question I was going to ask you is a little bit about limiting beliefs because in your book, On Second Thoughts, Maybe I Can, you talk a lot about overcoming limiting beliefs. And obviously at that time, you know, you were telling yourself, I can't do it now. It's impossible. This is not going to happen. What were some of the limiting beliefs you feel that you've had to overcome? Oh, my goodness. I, <laughs> There's I a list. write a book of just all the limiting beliefs. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> well, as I said, certainly I felt like I was never good enough because I was always judged for the way that I looked. And so I never felt I was worthy. Um, I, I knew that, you know, I did always did well in school. That was kind of like, you know, my area of strength, but, and, and I had friends, but, you know, not looking like everyone else, your body type is, is difficult. And so I didn't want to be seen. I wasn't good enough. People are going to judge me. I still, I have to say, and I'm just, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I'm, I'm just, I finished a second book. And even after that, I still can barely get, I don't like to say I'm an author because I don't, I always make an excuse or I have to qualify. Well, I'm not really an author because I don't really know how to write, but he, so it's still, it's still there. But the whole reason that the title of my book is on second thought, maybe I can is because for 50 years of my life, my knee jerk reaction, anytime anything was presented for me, and it could be something easy, like, uh, I don't know, you want to learn how to cook. I don't know. No, I can't do that. No, I don't do that. And why? Because I was fear. I it was fear, right? That I was going to fail, that I wasn't going to be good enough, all those limiting beliefs. And when I finally realized that when I had been through some situations that forced me and looking back, any time that I was forced to face my fear, that's when I grew exponentially. That's when I discovered things about myself that I had no idea existed. And I realized that if I just wait a second, so like on second thought, so first no, but then wait a minute, on second thought, why not? Maybe I can do that. Why am I limiting myself? What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. That's a powerful now, that's a powerful transition there from that switch of I don't do that or I can't do that. Yep. Now, don't think that my friends don't throw that in my face when I still say no occasionally and they're like, oh, "Really? What about maybe I can?" I said, "Oh." <laughs> I don't want you to think I'm perfect because I'm not. <laughs> uh, it's a fine line, isn't it? Like there's that on second thoughts, baby, I can. Yeah. And that's a great title. But it's also, like you said, way back at the start, you know, the boundaries and, and really being able to, I suppose, say no to the things that don't align with your journey or your vision or what you want to accomplish. Um, so I can definitely see that. That's very nasty of your friends to turn that on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They love to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What advice would you give to others who have this these limiting beliefs? I think there's a lot of people, like I said, age could be a thing. Like, I'm too old now. I can't do that now. Or, you know, different types of limiting beliefs um, that might be holding them back from living, you know, a healthy, happy, fulfilled life. You know, that's a, a, a really good question. I think the thing that sometimes that I've actually discovered helps me, which was something else that when I was posed to me, I was like, oh, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. I discovered journaling and I used to be afraid if like, I was intimidated by the whole thing. But what I discovered was if I open up a piece of paper, I have no idea what I'm going to write. And when I started doing this, the way that I finally wound up doing it, because like just me and a pen and a piece of paper literally like gave me heart palpitations. And a woman said, just start writing. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. And you'll be amazed at how that turns into something else that you never saw coming. And I find now that when I hit those moments, I start to journal about it. And... It usually does take me to the root of the reason I'm saying no or the root of the fear and um, just getting it out. And I think that that act of writing as opposed to just thinking helps you process it better. And so there are no excuses. I mean, yeah, if you want to let those limiting beliefs, sure, you can believe all those things, but kind of like, 
I think I said at 50, how's that working for you? Not so good. So why don't you explore the alternative? We all have those limiting beliefs. And I think when you realize that we all have them, it's not just you, that helps too. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a great message that you've got there. And I love that, you know, journaling has been a really good tool for you. My partner's a big journalist. She loves to journal a lot of the times. Um, and I go through stages with it myself. I have to admit, or sometimes I like to sit down and write, get it all out. Um, and other times, um, yeah, it just feels a little bit too hard, but I probably should listen to that advice. I think sometimes I get that writer's block or I sit down with a blank bit of page and go, what am I going to write about? Um, but I do recognize it that, that it does help. Yeah, definitely. It definitely does help. In your other book that you've got, it's called Your Heart Whispers Speak Wisdoms. Talk about the power of following the wisdom of your heart. Can you explain a little bit more what that means? Yes. Yeah, so that actually is a, con that's not my own book. It's a compilation book where I just okay. have one chapter in it. Yeah. That book, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the story that I, I put in there if it's okay if I share it with you, is one of those, it's a story that really was a huge pivotal turning point for me. Mm. So I, um, for years, had been involved in an organization where I was the treasurer, I was the vice president, and they wanted me to be president, but the president had to give speeches twice a year, not to about 150 people. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I can't do that because there is no way for all those limiting beliefs. I'm going to stand up in front of 150 people and let them judge what I look like, what I say, like no freaking way. And as time went on and now by now I was like almost in my mid 50s and I realized, you know what, kind of like what I started thinking about at 50, am I going to get to a point where I look back at my life and say, you did this because you cared about this for 10 years and you had good ideas and you had all those things, but you never took the step because you didn't want to get up and talk in front of people. Like public speaking, many people are afraid of public speaking. And... I said in a moment of maybe I can, I'm like, I'll do it. And then, of course, it wasn't until like six months later that I had to give the speech. And then I thought, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but what wound up happening was, is I stood up there and I had, no, you know, no saliva in my mouth and all the things looking out over everybody. And but I got to like a paragraph in and luckily it was not. I had to, I had it written out. So all I had to do was read it as, this, you know, just speaking off the top of my head. But I got to a point where when I had originally written it, it was something about my father and I practiced it and I never had any kind of emotion. But standing there in that moment, everyone looking at me, when I started to talk about my father who had passed away at that point, I got choked up. And then I looked out and I noticed that everyone, their eyes were locked on me and not in a judgmental way. They were feeling the message and the emotion that I was trying to convey. And that was so incredibly powerful to me. And afterwards, oh my goodness, you know, everybody came up to me. I never knew that you were such a fabulous public speaker, but I'm like, you I didn't know either. <laughs> and because of that moment, that actually has led me to actually talking to you today because I never, ever would have gone down this path. Wow. That, that story, like just the version you've given me there gives me goosebumps just to think about that and what a powerful, um, you know, presentation or speech that must have been. Talking to you today, like I just realized that you're so good at finding the silver lining. Like I think sometimes when we present problems or we present challenges to people, they're very good at picking up all of the negative and talking about the negative or what's holding them back. But you seem to be able to just circle around and think, okay, but I could get all this from it or this could be a positive experience. Or I could take this opportunity. Is that something that you've had to learn? Like, and if so, 
What advice can you give about looking at those positives or how do you switch that switch? So I think I've always been outwardly an upbeat person and a happy person, even though I go through tough times. So I think that there is a part of me that it does come naturally, but I have had to learn how to pay attention to my thoughts because one of the revelations to me was that my thoughts weren't true. I don't remember when I first heard that and I was like, wait, what? I, I think I never thought about it. Just whatever I thought, I accepted. And when I realized that, that I was letting my thoughts control everything, every aspect of my life, honing in and starting, and it's such a slow, arduous process because it doesn't happen right away. You know, we get caught up. And of course, I still do all the time. All of a sudden, it's like 20 minutes later and my mind has taken me down a rabbit hole. The difference is now is that I went, oh, hey, I see what I've just done. And then I can turn it around. But it has taken years and practice. But that realization um, has kind of, you know, started me learning to kind of cultivate that awareness of my thinking. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a trap we fall into, isn't it? We listen to our thoughts and maybe not to our heart. And it's like what we've been telling ourselves for so much, so long or what we believe is true, but is it actually, you know, what we really want to be doing? Is it what's driving us? Um, I think you, it's great that you can question that or you have the ability to step back from your thoughts and, and go deeper than just that initial sort of thought. Um, it's a powerful skill. I think it's one we all, we all need to learn at some point in our lives. And I think it definitely comes to us later. Um, I like that word wisdom <laughs> that, we, that was in that title of that book and it really speaks true, I think, with what you just said there. Um, off the back of that, I think, you know, a lot of us in midlife have a lot of responsibilities and you yourself, wow, what a crazy ride you've had with the responsibilities of being, you know, in self-care and looking after all those people that you love. And we can find it really hard to prioritize that self-care. You even mentioned it yourself. You felt guilty and you felt that it was selfish um, you know, to spend this time working on yourself when you had so many other responsibilities and things to do. What advice would you give to people now who are feeling that way, who are feeling very stuck, feeling like all these other responsibilities need to take priority and that their self-care can be put on the back burner? Like I said earlier, you're really, you're doing yourself and those other people a disservice. And I think that for me, when I did realize that I was exploding at my family, just if they said, you know, boo, the wrong way, because I had so much pent up anger and frustration. Is that the way I wanted to show up as a mother, as a wife, as a boss, you know, all of the different roles that I play? Definitely not. And I did realize that there is a direct correlation with how I'm taking care of myself. And I think what you find is we convince ourselves that there's not enough time for everything. And it really is all about priorities. And, you know, if you still feel like there's not enough time, come on, are you wasting time? We all waste time, right? Mm -hmm. If you really want something, believe me, you're going to find the time. So I think it, just comes down to it's you i hate to say it it's it's when i realized that it was like oh gosh it's all my fault i don't want to say my fault but it is this is my life but i'm the one who created it and you can look at it and feel badly but instead it's empowering because then you can say oh well if i created it thus far that means that i decide what it looks like going forward and so the minute that you stop with the excuses is when you really can start to take control because there are no excuses. I mean, I could have come up with a ton of different excuses at different times, and I have, and I, and we all do, but I'm not buying it anymore. If, I, if I, there's an excuse, then I, either I say to myself, then you must not really want it. Hmm. You know, decide. Yeah. And that's where it circles back to those priorities, doesn't it? Like you mentioned there, like if it's really important to you and it is climbing up the priorities list, like let's say it's your health and it is climbing up the priorities list, well, what are you doing 
to support that? And how can you change your behaviors or change your habits or your lifestyle to really show that, you know, health is important to you and it climbs up that list? I think it's a powerful realization to have. And I think a lot of us don't sit down and really think about, you know, that, that list of priorities that we have and put those, those things in order. Um, yeah, it's like going, going to drinks with the colleagues after work. Like how important is that? Or where does that priority sit in the big aspect of life? Um, it's a really powerful realization to have and a, and a great sort of skill to work on, I think. On your website, I think you're also working as a coach, am I correct there? Helping women? So I I am not currently doing that. Yeah. I um, I have a course. Okay. So I have a self-driven course. Uh about how do you start with maybe I can, you know, introducing some of these concepts into your life. And like I said, I am coming out with my second book in a month called The Sprinkle Effect, A Guide to Living a More Colorful and Fulfilling Life, which is, you know, it really is like the coaching in the book. Yeah. You know, a bunch of it's called the sprinkle effect because I love rain. I love ice cream. I love rainbow sprinkles. It makes me happy. And if you just sprinkle in some of these things into your life, you'll see how your life can change. So a sprinkle of mindset, a sprinkle of perspective, of action, discipline, joy, curiosity, connection. So all of those types of things I talk about, what are they? How do you incorporate them and then give you exercises to actually figure out how you personally, how does that look to you? Yeah, excellent. I like that title. So you're very good with your titles. I like the idea of just sprinkling things <laughs> in. And you spoke about it before. It's like, it's those small changes, isn't it? It's just, we don't have to change everything at once. So we don't have to go through this incredible transformation in such a short period of time. You know, you said it yourself before too. It's like that big perspective of that long-term vision of where you want to get to. And knowing that you're heading in the right direction by just making small, actionable changes that you can that you can achieve or you, you can be successful at. Speaking of actionable steps, and so now that you've got this book, um, what are maybe one or two big actionable steps, or where do people start if they have this realization? Like, okay, I need to make a change. I need to be working on my self care. I want to show up as a better person. What would be some actionable actionable steps that you would recommend? as a starting place. So it's, it's hard because I've said, you know, to me, and I've mentioned it several times is taking responsibility. I had a light bulb moment when I read the book, The Success Principles by Jack Canfield and Janet Switzer, and they have a formula because I'm a math person, <laughs> E plus R equals O, which stands for event plus response equals outcome. And I had removed the R my whole life. Event equals outcome. My father had a stroke. That sucks. My life sucks. But yet it doesn't have to be that way because it's how I respond to that. So making it simple, if it's raining outside, that's the event. If my first response is, oh, who cares? So I'll get wet. And I go outside with no umbrella and I get to work and I'm soaking wet. And now I have a miserable day versus, oh, I'll take an umbrella and I get to work and I'm fine. Same event, different response, different outcome. So I think um, starting to think in those terms, the idea about the thoughts and the mindset, but I guess I'm not giving, um, those are big, big things, actionable steps. I think to me, pick one thing, pick one thing. If it is your health, what is it? What are the things that you want to do? Is it drinking more water? Drink one glass more water a day. That's it. You know, if it's exercise, can you do something for 10 minutes more this week than you did last week? Small things like that. Maybe pick your top goal, the thing that's really bothering you you know you have to do something but you're not really motivated and break it down and if that if you're not successful with that then you need to either change that action or maybe break it down even in smaller steps maybe it's only five minutes a day five minutes a week more maybe it's half a glass of water you know until you find that point of success because 
once you do, and, and if you think about other times in your life, whether it's in sports or work or whatever it is, when you feel that feeling, man, you want more of it, right? So find what that is and make it happen. Sound advice. I really, really like it. It's like every journey begins with one step and it's just being able to find, you know, that first step, like you said, and just break that step down into the smallest step it can be um, as long as you're heading in that right direction. I also like the way you spoke about like looking at other parts of your life where maybe you've had a certain feeling or you've achieved something and being able to take, you know, that sensation or take that knowledge that you have in that success and bring it to, you know, the, the new area that you want to focus on. Uh, you know, these are powerful realizations. I think it's really good that you've you've been able to break that down or been able to clarify that for people who I suppose might be struggling and not knowing where to start and giving them permission to just start slow and get that snowball effect sort of rolling. Really, really good. Yeah, I like it. As someone who's transformed their own life in so many ways after speaking to you today, today what inspires you now? How do you continue to find you know, this purpose and passion to keep driving you forward after all, or everything you've been through. Because the transformation will never end. It ends when we take our last breath, right? So, you know, um, there's always new challenges. There's always new goals. There's always more that I want to do and can do. And so I've learned, and it's it's a little cliche, but I really have learned this, that it really isn't about the destination, it's the journey. Yeah. And this whole journey that I've been on now for more than a decade, that's what's given me amazing, just amazing sense of pride and joy. And I just can't wait to see what's next because if you had told me and I, I just wish, because I hate when people say this, and I'm like, oh, yeah, right. Honestly, if you had told me that this is where I would be now, 10 years ago, not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> I was really in a bad place, floundering. Yeah. So it's yeah. possible. Yeah, 100%, mate. You're living proof, definitely living proof of that, Debbie. It's incredible to see. What excites you right now? What are you looking forward to in the future that's coming up for you? Well, traveling, see, you know, for the longest time, because of my situation with my family and because of money reasons, I have not traveled. I have not enjoyed myself and done all the things that I had hoped to do or have hoped to do. And I'm very lucky, like you said, that I have some really good friends. Uh, some are married and some aren't. But even the married ones, they still like to travel with girls trips. So um, looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to what what's next in my future. You know, I think I want to yeah. write more books and I can't even believe that I'm saying that. And I have <laughs> seems like I I never thought I was. I, this is one another thing I would t tell people. Oh, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. I can't do that. I'm not creative, whether it was knitting or cooking or writing or any painting, nothing, nothing. I don't do that. I'm not creative. And it was amazing that once I started writing, it was like, now I had all these ideas and I was like, oh, I can do this. And then I could do this. I'm like, where did this come from? It was like somebody like popped the top off my head and all this stuff started spewing out that I didn't know was in there. So who knows what's next? And that's exciting. Yeah, definitely, mate. I love your energy. I love your energy, Deb, and it's great to see that, you know, you've got so much passion and so much drive and, you know, it doesn't matter that you're, you know, you know now beyond 50 and you're still going and this, it's like the world is, you know, your oyster. There's so many opportunities with travel, writing, cooking, all the things that you want to do and it sounds like, you know, you don't let anything hold you back. Those limiting beliefs are there, but you have the ability to sort of work your way through them and, and keep yourself moving forward, which is a really great message to share. So, I appreciate you jumping on the podcast today. It's been really great to chat to you. Um, if people want to find out more about you and what you do and more about your books, whereabouts can they get that information? My website, which is debbierweiss.com. You have to put the R in there. Yeah. And um, yeah, anything, anything and everything. I got some free stuff too, which is helpful, some worksheets and stuff to get you started on your journey. So 
Thank you so much for having me. This has been a fabulous conversation and a wonderful way to spend my Saturday night. Yep. Uh, mate, beautiful way to spend my Sunday morning. It's been great to wake up to this beautiful energy that you've shared with us today and all of the great advice that you've given, like everything you've spoken about today, like from a coaching perspective, it's like, yes, tick that box, tick that box, tick that box. You've done so many incredible things and your ability to overcome those challenges that you've faced um, and just stay positive and keep working forward is just a real credit to, um, you know, your courage um, and also your resilience, Deb. So, on you for that and thank you very much for sharing your story thanks for tuning in to the midlife mavericks podcast remember your journey to optimal health and vitality doesn't end here you're just getting started keep embracing the mindset of a maverick stay committed to your visions values and goals continue taking meaningful steps towards a life filled with energy purpose and fulfillment until next time keep thriving and living life on your own terms